Uh, tēnā tātou, ko whakarau i ka mai a ipurangi nei ki te ātau e te wete i ngā kaupapa o te mahere whakamua o te kangihira o te tairāwhiti uh, mo te tau 2020 mātahi ki te tau 2020 um, No mai haere mai, the Gisborne District Council would like to extend a warm welcome to you all and thank you for connecting to this online hui about one of the topics we're seeking your feedback on for our 2021 to 2031 long-term plan also referred to as the RTP. And the RTP sets out our work plan for the next 10 years. Uh, this webinar begins with a presentation followed by a question and answer section at the end. Uh, if you've submitted a question via Facebook, we'll answer it here. And if you want to ask a question live, you can do so in the chat function. Uh, please leave your name and our email address so we can get back to you. Uh, if we can't answer you right now, and also if you're watching this as a replay, you can send your questions to feedback at gdc.govt.nz. Okay, that brings us to today's kaupapa. We're talking about our community spaces and facilities. Now, our community places and open spaces are where lots of us spend uh, our leisure time, uh, among other things. Our online who today begins from a presentation, firstly from Penny Walsh, joining us live from Waiheke Island, uh, our cultural activities manager, followed by Diane Sutherland, our livable spaces manager. Kia ora kōrua. Uh, I now hand over to you both. That's enough from me. Um, kia ora uh, koutou, uh, nā, mai, nā mihi o tēnei rā. Thank you very much for allowing us this opportunity to talk to you about uh, our work, what we have been doing and what we're planning on doing. So my name is Penny Walsh uh, and I'm the Cultural Activities Manager. Uh, first of all, I'm going to just share with you uh, some of the things we have been doing, uh, what cultural activities covers and a little bit about what it doesn't cover. So excuse me while I just get into that. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. So cultural activities is a component of the Liverpool Communities Hub, which is what's known as a hub in the, in the council. There's five or six hubs that do all the different work within and livable communities covers catchments and biodiversity, cultural activities, recreation and amenity and solid waste. And for this moment now we're going to just talk about cultural activities. So the cultural activities area covers library and library services, the Lawson Field Theatre, War Memorial, Tairawhiti Museum and Art and Public Places and I'll, I'll expand on those a little bit more. So what have we been doing? Uh, well, pretty much we've been concentrating on getting the facilities, the buildings, the, the places where people go up to, up to scratch when it comes to contemporary uh, facilities and, and meeting what people expect today and also because a lot of them were just in, in, a, in a poor state. So that started in 2014 with the War Memorial Theatre, which had, was refurbished almost completely and is now a state-of-the-art theatre. They then followed by H.P. Williams Memorial Library, uh, which was jam-packed. The main problem was the inability to deliver services because it was just so full of people. There were like 5,000 people a week squeezing through that building and as someone once said to me it was a little bit trying to get into your car by going through the exhaust pipe. It was that tight. And more recently there's been an earthquake strengthening work done on the Lawson Field Theatre because that was closed in 2016 because of um, the requirement for earthquake strengthening. And we just took the time also to uh, do some deferred maintenance, which was the outside of the building was uh, wood that was fairly rotten in places and that's been skinned in a material that matches the uh, council building next door. So first off of the library, as I said, that was reopened in 2018 and we're forever grateful for the external funding that came from grants, the Williams family and a huge number of other places <coughs> that allowed us to get this magnificent building that we've got now. Uh, our 
future approach uh, for the library in particular is, is just to mention first off, we are in a really great position. We're in a great position across um, all of the cultural activities facilities and the library building has been future proofed. So those two big rooms you can see out the front there, if by some fluke of uh, history, forward history going and the book doesn't exist anymore, those rooms at the back, uh, at the front here can be uh, repurposed into anything actually. So they can be separated off from the rest of the building if it needed be. However, unlikely that there will be no such thing as the book. Just in the last uh, six months, book sales internationally have gone up 11%. And then just at the, uh, in the last two months, a record number of books have been uh, published in part because a lot of things were on hold because of uh, COVID <coughs> matters. So in the long-term plan, the library has uh, an operational plan that sits under the long-term plan, so the long-term plan quite high level, and the operational plan has uh, split into a number of strands. There's a partnership strand, a digital strand, an operational efficiency strand, and a post-COVID strand. We think that'll take quite a bit longer than um, just the next six to eight months. So the digital strand is about providing more digital flat platforms, a better website, adding more into the e-library, audio books, e-books, research materials that are paywalled, things like Ancestry.com, which is very popular with people. We already have a really great digital library, uh, and uh, any library member can use that anywhere, anytime. So we want to grow on that, and in part, we want to make sure that our local histories, our local materials, uh, digitized so that they can be accessed by any anyone. So what we've recently uh, just done is a, there was a local newspaper here a few years ago called the Eastland Sun. We've digitized that. Uh, we're keeping the PP Faro draw newspaper um, microfilm. So that has a 500 year archival life. So that can at any time be digitized. Of course, we digitise the Gisborne Photo News, and that just continues to have an unbelievable number of hits on it. It's incredible that how much it is used. The partnership strand is around how can we deliver services in the community in a way that doesn't impact on rates, but is a contemporary and is what people need, and that. In the main, at the moment, it's meaning, because I'll merge here with the post-COVID strand. For instance, we have a partnership with government that's just being developed at the moment, and that is supporting us to support you, the members of the uh, community, to do the things that you need to do in a time where jobs are difficult to get. So you will be rolling out soon, we'll be rolling out a whole lot of um, courses in the library around um, around how to make a CV, how to apply for a job. It's still amazing how much person has to deal with the government through RealMe and so many people still do not have an email address and it's almost like you don't exist if you don't have one these days. So we it also working with Spark to provide a skinny jump so that you can um, join up from into the internet from home as well. So look out for those coming up. <clears throat> the operational efficiency strand is exactly what it means. It's a review of every single thing that is delivered from the library and pretty much is it relevant today? Should we keep it? Should we stop it? Should we start something new? So essentially the uh, library, <clears throat> as I said in the beginning, is not just a physical place to go, it's a place where people meet, where they can do all of the things they need to do just to live a good life. Another example is that every Thursday in the mornings, there is a JP available in the library, and that has proven to be extremely popular because it's a neutral space and people need to see a JP, and it's sometimes a bit tricky to go and knock on someone's door to do that. 
So with the uh, good news of level one kicking in, programs will restart and that's for children, teenagers and adults. And what we want to know from you is what sort of programs would you like? What sort of things do you want to do to come and meet in the library and learn or do socially or just for your um, pleasure? Uh, one pleasurable one for a particular group of Teenagers is that we have a manga group. That's the Japanese, um, I was going to say cartoon, but that's terrible. It's a Japanese um, illustrated type movies and um, books. That's quite a big group. So, but what do you want to see? That's what we want to know. Do you want to come and form book groups with other like-minded people? Do you want to play Scrabble in the library? Do you want to do Lego? Do you want to go back to board games? Whatever it is, we'll have a little think about it, get together and see what we can do. That's in the partnership strand in the future. The Lawson uh, Field Theatre reopened in September 2019 and two thirds of that was funded in grants. The earthquake strengthening I mentioned earlier, the outside cladding. And what you can't see to the right is a cascade of uh, concrete steps going down into the marina park next door. So that was about making the use of the space we've got and connecting um, those steps can be seating for whatever's happening on the part or you can turn it around and performances can happen on that patio to the right there. So um, that was having an unbelievable number of bookings, but it's also recently had an unbelievable number of cancellations due to the COVID situation. But we're expecting that it's going to pick up immediately. Uh, the War Memorial Theatre was opened in two, reopened in 2014. And what that has done is opened the door to big touring events from throughout New Zealand and Australia. Quite a large number of the events we have are from Australia. And I quite often will work there of an evening and the thing I've noticed the most is that every single event that occurs, there is a portion of people who have lived in Gisborne all their lives, their parents have lived here all their lives, and they have never ever set foot in any incarnation of what the War Memorial Theatre um, has been. So that is really great news. It sort of indicates that the promoters are bringing things that people want to see. So you don't have to travel to go and uh, see an event, it will come here. And we're expecting that to pick up. And of course, um, in a couple of weeks, 10 days or something like that, we've got the Tide for the Arts Festival uh, using a couple of our facilities, War Memorial and the Lawson Field, but they'll be all over town. So it's really important to see, celebrate, and nurture our own talent and careers in the arts because it is a growing area. In fact, it's well proven that for every dollar spent on the arts, that's library and the performing and visual arts, there is a $6 economic return. Uh, and it's a really <clears throat> ironically quite a good time to be going forward in um, the use of our theatres. They're not going to be languishing with the people not coming to them. And, and there's an analogy about that <clears throat> and that a lot of people will be aware of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers when uh, in the 1930s, in the Depression and the war period, uh, they produced 31 musicals which were hugely successful, successful across the world. So when times aren't good, the arts have a real place to play and we're really looking forward to that coming up in our uh, more renewing our international relationships people with people and discovering what's new. The theatre has a website, bisbontheatres.com, and I've just clicked on the What's On page there, which you can scroll through, and you just can go directly there and book tickets to anything. Oh, by the way, Dave Dobbin, he's back, it's on, and it's on during the festival period as well. Uh, the Eroica Symphony Orchestra one just got cancelled, unfortunately. 
So you can find things all in one place going forward that uh, to buy your tickets, see what's coming up. And if you're a promoter, you can look at the venues, see what techie, techie things interest you or that you need as, as, as well. So the work we've done around, a lot of work around the marketing and the ticketing. So the ticketing is online with Ticketech or you can go to the iSite. There's a partnership with Trust Tide Arfati and delivered through the iSite. And the iSite's now become a place where you can get tickets for everything. All of the different ticketing companies now are pretty much fed out through the iSite, which is a really great partnership. We're looking uh, small and local as well. There's uh, an event site in Gisborne called uh, Gizzy Local. It's at gizzylocal.com. And you can just see, we're just having a little practice there. You see in the, the little peach, pink, apricot colored button there that says Gisborne Theatres, that's being updated. So whenever you go to look what's on on that site, you'll be able to click on that and go to our website too. That's live now. Um, been District Council, Tikoni Hira or Tairawhiti, also has a relationship with Tairawhiti Museum. The museum used to be a directly delivered uh, council activity, and in fact the council owns all of the buildings around the museum, the Wiley Cottage, Leisner House and the Star of Canada. But a while back, um, well nearly 20 years ago, a trust was formed and we, the ratepayers and the council now um, pay a sum each year for delivery of museum services and that's our education, collections and of course currently the really important exhibition to Te Whaihanga which is all of those objects in Taonga that have not been seen for 250 years as they went um, from Aotearoa to England and have been housed there ever since. So that's pretty exciting and well worth having a look at. So what we want to know from you this year, the contract is up for renewal and there's likely to be opportunity for you to comment on it. What do you want from that museum service as well? Art in public places also comes under tight RFT and um, to be clear, the council doesn't commission and put up artworks public art. This is the most recent one. Um, there's a separate independent charitable trust uh, in Public Places Charitable Trust and they have um, they have sought all the external funding to develop uh, concepts with artists and the actual manufacturing of this one. This one was a case in point and it is at the end of Roberts Road on the Oniroa walkway at um, Oniroa Waikanae Beach. So there's also some involvement from council with the dock first landing site to Puhi Kaiti Cook Landing site. So the council was involved in that to a certain degree and alongside with Ngāti Oni Oni um, all the uh, work around um, Titirangi Kaiti Hill and the most obvious one in the public art kind of monument area is the big uh, the big disc that uh, represents Te Maro, uh, an ancestor of the Ngāti Oni, Oni Iwi. Uh, another example is just next door to the Fitzherbert Street, Peel Street Bridge is the Margaret Seabright Monument and Margaret Seabright was of course a very important uh, woman with regard to women's rights and women's suffrage and for the 125 year anniversary of women's suffrage in this country, first place in the world where women and Indigenous women were able to vote, that got a big spruce up and new signage so that it was good and ready to go. So those, there's those um, small things as well. And again, the funding and partnership with the community and special interest groups is absolutely key. It is not a massive strain on ratepayers' um, money. 
and a lot of the public art that you see now sits within sits within other projects. And another one of those projects, of course, is a navigations project. And I and I just uh, in the navigations project that included the Oniroa walkway, which pretty much was the starter of all the cyclone walkways that are emerging around the district. That if you can you can just see at a glance that it's totally breathed life into the walking and cycling um, community, which is so important for community well-being, physical and um, social well-being. So along the way, you will find these pause points and called Tupapa. It's the Tupapa, our stand, our story trail. And you can stand there, look through the wee slot that looks like it's painted blue, but in fact is the sky on the other side looking out to Kuriapawa. So these are physical and digital pauses, pause points. So you can find out about our history, what you see at those pause points. And at the moment, I think they could be used more. The the website itself, which is um, I'm showed there in the with the slide showing the app, you download an app on your phone. The website is so much more. You can read the stories there, or you can go and listen to them um, on your phone as you go to those ports points. A really, really important part of the navigations project is telling our stories and actually everything going across all of the cultural activities, the venues, the, the, the theatre venues, the library, these types of pause points, all are about telling our stories, hearing the world stories and being able to apply that into our own lives. So I mentioned earlier the area, this area is proven to bring for every dollar spent a $6 economic return. And if you need be, I can give you links to those. Uh, studies and of course these are the things why people move back here why they come here and why people stay here and we can see already there's 86,000 repatriated New Zealanders have come back from overseas and they are going to be fed throughout the country and they are likely to stay and the things that we've preset and set up in this, in this area I think are going to, are really going to be uh, services and facilities that really will attract people to stay home and it's going to be really good for our community as we go as they're all about us it's about seeing and hearing our stories we connect to the real wider world and we stick with our current vision which is tied Afati first so I'm not sure if there's any um, questions coming through but certainly happy to answer them really want to see your ideas and I'll just pop myself back in here whoops I'm lost oh there I am hi again <laughs> uh, so we really want to hear your thoughts around in this area your ideas and we really want to put them all into the big pot and so that we can integrate those into our operation plans for the theatre and the libraries in particular, but any other thoughts, throw them at us, please. We really, really want to hear them. Kumutu. Marty there. Thanks, Penny. <laughs> I'll do a little throw now. So Dian, uh, thank you, Penny. Uh, that's Penny's presentation done. So if you do have questions, can you chuck them in the chat, please? Um, just to the side, then we'll answer them at the end. And we're now going to hear from Diane Sutherland. She's right there and she's going to give us the second part of the presentation. Thank you. Nice little advert there, Cherish. <laughs> Kia ora tato, ko Diane Sutherland, aho. Uh, ko Livable Spaces Manager, mō te kaunehira o te tairawhiti. So um, my name is Diane Sutherland and I'm the Livable Spaces Manager for Council. Um, so I'm just going to share my presentation for you. How's it going now? You see your desktop? There we can, now we can see your presentation. Awesome. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so the Recreation and Amenity Activity um, covers uh, our parks and sports fields, playgrounds, street trees, gardens, cemeteries, public 
conveniences, which includes our public toilets and changing rooms, as well as the Olympic pools. So um, this area is obviously really focused on community wellbeing um, and managing open space. And for us going forward, some of the key drivers are around adaptation to climate change, um, being cost effective with the operations budget that we have, um, and working collaboratively with others to achieve more. Um, so you'll see that when we get to the point of um, sharing a, a draft long-term plan, um, and now we're in that, that pre-consultation phase, so really important and really interesting to hear from you about what you think our focus should be on. Um, but I'll also just talk about what we have achieved to date and what we're looking at going forward. Um, so restoration planting is, is critical for us. Um, and again, thinking about the drivers that we respond to. So adaptation to climate change, these are our natural buffers um, with sea level rise. Uh, and we've seen the, the types of spring tides and storm events that we're having. So areas like this, um, including Kōpūtūtia, along the length of Centennial Marine Drive out to the Big River in Gisborne, uh, Midway, Waikanae, also some work happening in, at Wainui Beach and historically um, up at Tokamaru Bay. Um, so June planting is, is, a, is a really effective way of supporting those natural buffers um, and as well as providing habitat for shorebirds and our seabird life. Um, a focus for us going forward is also thinking about those corridors that we naturally have, which is our, our rivers and stream sides. Um, we have a lot of open space in Tairawhiti. We're, we're really fortunate in that way. Um, many councils, when they're planning and making their strategic plans looking forward, are trying to secure more land. We actually, we have a lot, um, and we're in a really good position to be able to use these areas for um, creating those environmental habitats. So riparian margins such as Tarihiru, um, we've seen really good work happen at Waikanae and again in collaboration with others, so community groups, uh, hapu, dock. Um, we would like to see more of this. And that kind of has a, a double outcome for us in that we achieve more, so it's space that we already have, um, and we're working towards environmental outcomes and fresh water outcomes, but also from an operational perspective, we are spending less as far as not having big tracts of open space that we are needing to mow. Um, and that's the same for our dune systems too. Uh, we do have one of the higher levels of um, areas that we mow in our district compared to other councils. Um, and so we're just looking to sort of rationalise that a little bit and think about how we achieve more together um, by thinking about things a little bit differently. Um, also, the work that we do in partnerships. So um, this is an example of the FIRE Titirangi programme. Um, it's in partnership with Nati Onioni. Um, so pine trees were removed or harvested from from a big section of Titirangi Maunga um, a few years back. And since then, 60,000 native plants have been planted there. And um, we've really seen the, the Maunga come alive, um, uh, especially when you think maybe 10 years ago, just with people walking uh, and achieving those health outcomes and doing the Titirangi um, Everest Challenge. So hope to see you all there again this year. Um, but yeah, really Nati Onioni uh, taking a lead now, which is fantastic to see. So um, really uh, uh, the, the outcomes up there are amazing and um, that connection to the whenua is, is um, you know, in a long-term vision. So much, much further beyond sort of the 10-year plan that, that we have here. Um, uh, so yeah, Jordan, Mihi and Angus there on the photo on the left um, and also the education programs that are happening with our schools. So they're, they're doing a fantastic job and we would like to see more of that. So Waihariri is another um, really special place and we have a management plan for Waihariri that was developed um, in, uh, with engagement from 
with hapu and uh, partnership there with the marae and the local community and the wider community and again looking to achieve environmental outcomes um, and really uh, reinvigorate uh, Waihiriri Domain as a regional destination park which we know it has been um, a really significant place um, for, for many of us in our memories um, of Waihiriri and, and that remains but a little bit of investment will go a long way there. Um, just going to go to our sports fields and parks. So, um, just thinking about partnerships, um, many of you may be aware about the community facility strategy that was prepared um, with engagement with the community a few years back, and now is a partnership approach between uh, Sport Gisborne Tairafati. Trust Tairawhiti and GDC. Um, there's been a series of workshops recently uh, with those who are interested to attend. Um, and we're really looking at thinking about those drivers around cost efficiencies, about how we provide for our community well-being, um, but in a really effective way, not only being cost effective for council, but being effective for uh, the resources of our clubs and codes as well. Um, so the, the proposals that were discussed were around a hub for our sports fields um, and that means that we would create a place, a single place where people would go and there would be between sort of eight to ten um, sports fields. So regardless of what code you participate in or what club you, you um, are a member of, you go to that, that one facility and it also has training fields and really good quality lights and um, administration and club rooms and changing rooms that are really consistent with what you would expect uh, for a city and a district our size. Um, and then there are lots of efficiencies with that too. Um, as I was saying for clubs and codes, they're, they're no longer being the building managers of their club room sort of thing. They are part of a bigger entity and there's lots of support um, in those ways. One of the other hubs is around courts um, and indoor courts, as well as some outdoor courts. And um, we know that Victoria Domain is, um, has been the, the home of netball for a long time now, and uh, um, very, um, what would you say, um, uh, recipients that, that um, we can share a bit more love with um, to achieve more for, for that code, knowing that I think it has the highest participation levels um, across Tairawhiti. So, um, and also that would be a hub for basketball and other court um, activities. And another hub is around um, water sports. So we know that Waka Ama um, is hugely popular here, um, as well as uh, rowing and canoeing and kayaking. Um, and providing good support and facilities for those codes too, who um, you know, are national and international uh, winners. Um, so uh, you know, providing good quality access to the water. Um, and then we have a regional sports hub, which um, up at Whakaro Park in Rua Tauria, um, and, and they were already you know, really living that, that kind of hubbing um, way. Uh, and being that sort of destination for, for a number of different sports and codes. Um, so more engagement to come as far as the community facility strategy, but um, again, just demonstrating needing to be cost effective and um, efficient with the resources. And those hubs will be, um, they are reliant on external funding. Um, so really looking to pitch to central government to fund those outcomes. That, that's not a hit for the ratepayers. Um, there is a benefit for the ratepayers in that um, while, uh, so we have all these sports fields that we maintain and by hubbing we will be able to um, use our resources more, um, I guess, in a more concentrated way by delivering for those specific hubs um, and then a, a lower level of service for the other parks, more like a sort of a general park. But we've got a long way to go um, in making those decisions, but things are well on track. Uh, so we also provide playgrounds, and in the last few years, um, we have installed a new playground at Titadangi, as you can see there. 
um, with our previous mayor, Ming Foon. Um, we've also installed a new playground in Rotoria and Waikirikiri. Um, and uh, the Waikirikiri example was a really great example of collaborating with the community um, and also Sport Gizwa Tairawhiri to really ensure that what we're providing is um, what that community needs and is looking for um, and being really inclusive through the design and implementation process. Um, so we will be looking to do more of that. Uh, we do have quite a few tired uh, playgrounds around the place. Um, so we are constantly ensuring that they are kept to a level that is safe. Um, but also, uh, you know, I just want to recognise that we have some playgrounds out there that do need uh, to be replaced, such as uh, Waihariri. Um, and again, we'll be working with the community that is funding dependent. Um, so I'll, I'll be hoping that we can get some, some capital investment from council for, for some playground renewals um, going forward. Street trees is a, um, is a topic that I hear from the community a lot on. Um, so they're part of a bigger picture uh, in council's view. Um, they do a number of things, but firstly, they are another ecological corridor. Um, if you like sort of thinking about um, when I was talking about riparian planting along the rivers and our streams and our coastal buffers, but also uh, street trees support in urban nahiri. Um, and although I'm showing you photos of uh, the plum trees down Harris Street uh, in this image, um, they have a role to play. And in, uh, when we're thinking about adaptation to climate change and the cooling that we'll be looking for um, to, to mitigate the effect of an urban island sort of effect, which is you know, where we have lots of impermeable surfaces, such as concrete roads and driveways and footpaths, and the heat that comes off those, um, you will know the, the relief that you get and the effect that shade from trees has. Um, so we are, we are invested in a program to uh, replace trees that are at the end of their life um, and also uh, focusing on native trees going forward wherever possible. Um, there is a little bit of contention at times using native trees. So um, if you have a street on your northern um, boundary of your property, the evergreen trees that don't leave their, lose their leaves over winter, um, some residents are really reluctant to have that species um, outside their property, potentially, especially if the house is close to the road. Um, so we go through uh, a full consultative process where we are looking to further um, plant trees along road margins, but um, it is definitely part of that bigger picture. So I would advocate that if you are approached, um, this is not just in Gisborne, but going forward up the coast too, um, and our townships, or our rural and coastal townships, um, that uh, I'm hoping that something that between the species that list that you provided that you can find something that you think um, will work and uh, we'll start to really see the benefits of, of these um, plantings. Um, just to go on a little bit further about street trees, I do receive a lot of inquiries around um, things like leaf litter and whether trees could be um, lifted or thinned because of things like shade um, and leaf litter in regards to leaves and um, seeds and pods falling on people's roofs and gutters. Um, just so you're aware, our, our policy at the moment and the budget that's associated with that policy really only allows us to ensure that roads are accessible. So we lift trees to provide a, a clearance along the road carriageway and that footpaths have that clearance and under power line. So anything in addition to that, we, we don't have a budget for. Um, and I know that that does cause um, a bit of concern for, for people who, who really um, have issues with, with, say, leaf litter on their driveways and, and gutters and things like that. Um, so the policy is on our website if anybody wants to take a look. And again, it, it may be something that people want to contribute to through the long-term plan. I know it's a bit of a hot issue. 
Um, and we also have a number of park trees that you can see there by the Tupapa uh, sculpture, which Penny was referring to, our lovely Kohutukawa, which um, we, we see quite a bit along our coastal reserves. We also provide amenity gardens, um, and so these are really around placemaking. So we see, um, so here we've got flowering annuals uh, at Botanical Gardens and Calvin Park, and we uh, used to have uh, quite a few along our median strips and roundabouts. So we've made a, um, a, a decision, or council made a decision that going forward, we wanted to plant more natives. Um, and, and particularly in a city entrance way. And again, that was around that driver of providing habitat, but also around a double win with um, some, some quite considerable operation savings um, by planting native species that you don't then need to replace twice a year. Um, and also for our gardens team, to be working in the median strip, it's a high risk zone, uh, so reducing the time that they need to spend in those, in those road corridors has been really beneficial, um, and and they still look they still look great. Um, so cemeteries is another activity that we provide. Uh, so we have thirteen cemeteries across the district. Our main ones are Tarahiru, Paratahi, and Tolaga. Um, and we provide a really, we're driven to provide a really cost effective service there um, to make that affordable for, for the whole community. Um, we are one of the cheaper councils across New Zealand, so we're the 10th cheapest for purchasing of plots um, or interment plots, uh, so ash plots, um, and that's, that's been a really considered uh, decision. Uh, we did have a fees and charges policy which looked at recouping 80% of the cost of um, the activity from those that were purchasing plots and paying for burials. We've actually offset that more with our general ratepayers now to ensure that sort of plot purchases stayed around $1,000 um, which is still you know quite considerable for many families um, to pay that, but uh, alternatively, it would have been looking to almost double. So um, really happy to be able to keep the costs uh, for the service as low as we can manage. Um, uh, so not too much planned for our cemeteries other than providing the, the amazing service that my team down there um, provide. Um, but things like creating new ash gardens, like you see in the photo here, um, that's something that we need to do to, to keep up with demand. Um, yeah, so, sorry, that's probably a bit of a morbid discussion for some, but um, it is a critical service that we, we provide. Um, so public conveniences, this is the lovely toilet up at Tokamaru. Um, and you can see how well it's cared for with the beautiful succulents and shells out the front there by our community caretaker. Um, we have a number of public toilets that we provide across the district and it is one of the activities that we uh, probably struggle a little bit to keep co as a cost effective um, activity because we have so many toilets and they are so dispersed across Tairawhiti. So for example, it might take one contractor a one hour drive to clean that toilet um, three times a week. And for those really uh, far and away in distant places, um, particularly in the winter period, there may not have been anybody there. Um, but it is one of those um, services that we take really seriously in that um, you know, there's a public health component to that. Um, but it also enables people to stay longer, um, to spend a whole day in places um, and our visitor destination areas. Um, so it's a, it's a service we need to provide, but one of the things we're looking at to keep it cost effective is around um, rationalising when they are open, where we provide toilets um, going forward. So we have a new toilet going in at Farihika, um, Farikahika, sorry, this, this year um, in Hicks Bay. Um, 
but really we're we're looking to really rationalize the the service that we provide um, it's one of the areas where through our annual resident survey we we score really highly in a number of areas like our sports fields and our general parks and things but public convenience is, is a really is a, is a real struggle to get those um, user satisfaction levels up a bit um, The Olympic pool, uh, so it's a hot topic at the moment and uh, in a really well-loved facility. Uh, we're really fortunate to have this facility in Tairawhiti um, and the new complex is, is going to be amazing. So um, for our community well-being, for the whole range of our community, from little tots to the um, more elder folk in our community, uh, we're really excited to have received that $40 million central government funding. Um, it is a really well-loved resource, but uh, it was built in 1974, and we've, we've, really, we've really rinsed out the value of, of this facility. Um, anybody who regularly goes there will know the, the pool closures that we've had due to uh, different elements of infrastructure breaking down, whether it's the the heat exchange or the pumps. Um, so it's, it's really been a lifeline and um, really it's fantastic that we're, that we're open. Um, so I just wanted to let you know a little bit about what this will look like going forward. So as part of the funding application for that 40 million, um, we needed to be shovel ready for our um, government to release those funds. And we've had work start earlier this month around um, some uh, renewal work on the outdoor pool, so you can see that uh, you know the photo where the family are. Um, so that has had some repairs while it's been closed for winter, um, just so that we can fill that and open it up for summer. Um, and the outdoor pool, the hydro slide that you see there, and the dive pool will remain open uh, during this first phase of construction. Um, and the the, the covered pool that you see in the background of that photo and the reception and changing rooms and that, that whole stretch of building there will be disestablished and, and the real mahi will begin. But we'll still have that, that um, series of pools available, including the toddler pool for the summer going forward. And then we actually do a bit of a flip and um, so once this part, so this is the indoor part of the pool, is uh, all developed and open, this is what you'll um, have access to initially while the outdoor area gets the same love. Um, so new outdoor pool, hide your slide, um, and you know, a bit of landscaping and things out there, and an outdoor changing room, which will be quite cool, meaning you're not running from the building um, out to the outdoors. Um, and having an outdoor toilet and things there too. So um, yeah, this information is all on our website. Um, and I think I read a question about um, why could the 40 million be spent elsewhere? So I know we get a bit of feedback, so we know that our, um, we've, we've got some work to do still about the stormwater that runs into our rivers and things like that. So um, it's a good question. Um, but that, that 40 million is, is only available for, for the Olympic pool. Um, and we did put funding applications, we have got funding applications to central government to enable some of those other projects to happen. But uh, that 40 million, 40 million was around infrastructure and um, needed to be shovel ready and was for the Olympic pool um, off the seed money that council had already invested to get us to this point. So I think that's it from me. Um, I'm not sure if you have any questions. It's a nice note to end off on though, Diane. Uh, you know, what's happening with the pool. And just to be clear, the 40 mil uh, from central government is not something that we're asking about in the long-term plan, but we love to see, you know, it's nice to conceptualize what that'll look like for us and for all our kids once it's done. So thank you for that. Uh, we do have a question, um, and we've got a little bit of time. So I'll get as many as we can answered here. Otherwise, please send them to feedback at gdc.govt.nz, and we will get you a timely response. Uh, Penny, 
has there been much involvement from whānau or community in the design of these placemaking examples or appetite for this in the future? Unmute, please. Was it me that did that, was it? Yeah. There we go. Oh, oh yeah, if you can find me through a file. Yep, yep, I'll... I'll uh, Are you there? There has been involvement, and I'll uh, be frank about it. So in order of the the facilities that came out, the War Memorial Theatre uh, is a war memorial that was um, gifted by government. And so the focus around that theatre was as a war memorial, and that's why you walk in, it's all poppies and poppies and uh, the quilts that are in there and the paintings in there are all about uh, people from this area who have gone to war. So that was the focus of that one. The library uh, at the time, to be frank, the council wasn't so great with um, uh, engagement with iwi uh, mana whenua in particular. So the, there was appointed, um, Sir Derek Lardelli was the cultural advisor and I, I wish I could have popped up that picture, I probably still could, of the front of the library in particular, where you'll see um, he advised on every aspect, and in fact, parts of the design of the building structure itself was changed to accommodate that. But visually, for community, there's the Kakao pattern on the, um, it's like a chevron pattern on the entrance in the way in, which is of course uh, traditionally the way uh, you do, uh, it leads you into something. Uh, the potama pattern on the eaves of the building as you come in. Also, the separating of the old original part of the building and the new part of the building, there's just a two story potama embedded into the concrete, which is quite amazing. So that's li linking, you know, the heavens, the foot on the ground, the old and the new, and that kind of thing. In that, oh, no, you can see the picture. I was going to say, in the curved room that you see at the front, which is um, a youth space, there, the windows are floor to ceiling, and each one of those windows has a copy, uh, a facsimile of um, the East Coast page of the Treaty of Waitangi on it. So, you, the idea of that is so young people can walk right up to that and put their hand on it, see their ancestors' um, signatures, see what was signed up for, and also, uh, uh, or it's one of the rare pages where all of the Pākehā signatories are on it as well, so it's, 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 it speaks to all people. Now, the fact of the matter is that teenagers are not going to open a book and look at a facsimile of the treaty, so it's right there in their faces every single day and we've flipped it around so that you can read it from outside as well. So there are all those kind of elements in there, right down to the colors, the uh, council has a policy, a very firm policy that you don't see so much yet because it's in a transition period uh, around all signage is bicultural, all the basis, I'm just using the library as an example. Uh, so there's a number of meeting rooms in there and to tie in with the navigations project, uh, they, all of those rooms were named after constellations. So in the courtyard, there's the whole a lot of them in there with the names in Māori and English, all the rooms are named as constellations. And it's quite interesting how those things embedded into your architecture become familiar. Whereas uh, if you ask someone, uh, what's the Māori word for and Tardis is part of a constellation. What part of a constellation is? Well, that's Rehua, and it's these things are becoming ordinary, just just part of the fabric of our life. So that's one part. Might not necessarily answer your question. However, now it's only what three or four years later. Uh, I would say that everything the council does, as far as any infrastructure or change to any um, part of the Fenua, is definitely consulted um, with the hapu iwi of that particular place. And that applies to the language used in the buildings as well. 
So, uh, yeah, what I guess, just not speaking on behalf of Diane, but watch the spot with the pool because I think there's a really fantastic relationship going on between iwi and the development of the pool as well. So look out for that one. Get amongst it even. Hi, thank you, Penny. Um, I'm going to throw one quick, quick, well, I'm going to ask you to answer as quickly as you can, Diane, just to squeeze one more in, but this question is for you. Uh, does the GDC apply tactical urbanism to its design approach for parks and playgrounds? Kia ora, Sherish. Hey, um, we, we used to have an urban design planner actually on board, uh, but we tend to use consultants for our design work. Um, so tactical urbanism, I'm, um, I'm thinking of, of that in an urban design sense um, and around crime prevention uh, through environmental design. But I think you're thinking higher level um, than that. And, and we really capture that, I guess, um, through our spatial plan, and other areas of council that are a bit outside of my my operational um, perspective. Sorry there, um, Cherish, but we can certainly get back to you on that one. <laughs> Fantastic. Now we've got a few other questions that we're not going to get to answer here. Um, I am going to... Um, ask everyone here that if you need to know a little bit more about the long-term plan and just to explain that the aspects that both Penny and Diane have spoken to are things that we're asking your feedback on uh, to help steer what will be the next part of the long-term plan which is the consultation part early next year so for now we want to know do you want uh, to apply your rates to more of that or kind of the same of what's already happening, uh, or less of that, you know, given that there are roads and there are other things to consider also when it comes to allocating uh, rate money. Uh, so I'd like to end us there. Thank you to everyone that's joined us and we have two more online hui next week. Uh, if you're watching the replay, please send the questions to feedback at gdc.govt.nz and that is to ensure that we get you a, a response. So comments on Facebook, while they give us an idea, uh, send it to that email address so we can give you a, um, ensure to get you a response.